Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. Border Patrol agents and the Biden administration are expecting a surge of illegal border crossings, up to 18,000 migrants every day. This could start in hours or in days. We'll tell you why. The 2016 Hillary Clinton campaign is facing fines for violating a federal election commission rule. This is about money used to fund the infamous Steele dossier. How much did it cost her? A U.S. district judge has blocked the military's vaccine mandate for all members of the Navy seeking religious exemptions. A ruling that previously covered just 35 Navy SEALs now covers about 4,000 others. Russian forces continue to bomb the Ukrainian capital after repositioning their troops. That's after the Russian military said they were scaling down their forces around Kyiv to help make progress in peace talks. The number of Ukrainians who fled the Russian invasion has surpassed the worst case predictions made by the United Nations. Over 4 million people, including 2 million children, have left their homeland. We hear what nonprofits on the ground are doing to safeguard against human trafficking. There's a bottleneck at the border that's expected to break and result in a flood of migrants. That's if the administration lifts an immigration policy called Title 42, which expires today. Now, the Biden administration is under renewed pressure to handle this anticipated surge. NTD's Melina Weiskopf has the details. Today is the last day for the Centers for Disease Control to review Title 42, a policy created during the start of the CCP virus pandemic. It allows for Border Patrol agents to deny entry to migrants without considering their asylum claims to prevent the spread of COVID-19. But with the White House lifting other pandemic restrictions, will they lift this one too? When the CDC ultimately decides it's appropriate to lift Title 42, there will be an influx of people to the border. And so we are doing a lot of work to plan for that contingency. I think the Department of Homeland Security is now preparing for this, including vaccinating non-citizens taken into custody with a goal to give 6,000 vaccinations per day by the end of May. Senator Bill Haggerty wants to expand Title 42, but not to protect us from the pandemic, but for another deadly threat, fentanyl. 100,000 young people have died in America just this past year alone from drug overdoses. And this war is being waged on America by the Chinese Communist Party that are sending fentanyl and its precursors into Mexico where they're being manufactured and then shipping those drugs across the border, killing young people in my state. The administration has called on the Pentagon to deploy troops to the border. They're preparing for up to 18,000 migrants per day, nearly three times the rate we're seeing now. In a document published today, the DHS says they're increasing temporary holding capacity to process high volumes of individuals in a humane manner. And it's not just immigrants from Central America and Mexico. There are also folks from Ukraine and Russia. Our apartment, which we rented, it's, it's like, it's yeah, destroyed, it's you know? Yeah, yeah so yeah. We, we'll, we'll, last year we lived in Kyiv and it's totally destroyed, you know, so. And because of these issues, Senator Rob Portman says the answer is a change in asylum policy. What you need to do is change the asylum policy, because right now we have a pull factor in our country. We are telling people if you come to the border and you claim asylum, you can come in. Republican lawmakers have repeatedly criticized yeah, Biden's border policies, and now two Democrats from the border state of Arizona are also pressing for the administration for a clear action plan. And facing a pressing deadline this week, the White House has not yet decided whether or not they'll lift or extend that Title 42 Trump era immigration policy. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskopf, NTD News. President Biden gets his second COVID-19 booster today. This as the administration launches a new website and pleads for new COVID money. NTD's Iris Tao has more. President Biden getting his fourth COVID shot and telling the nation. We're now in a new moment in this pandemic. Does not mean that COVID-19 is over. 
It means that COVID-19 no longer controls our lives. The move today punctuates Biden's announcement of a new website, COVID.gov, that he's calling a one-stop shop for information on testing, vaccines, and treatment. It also follows a Tuesday decision by the FDA and the CDC to approve a second booster for Americans over 50. Those who are 50 and older, as well as those who are immunocompromised, can now get it, get even more protection than they have from the initial uh, first doses. But amid debate over the need for a second booster, the CDC has only made the extra shot an option for those eligible, stopping short of recommending it. It also comes amid criticism of the administration's overall approach to vaccinations. Here's Congressman Steve Scalise speaking at a hearing today. Sadly, we've had to endure the Biden administration's alienation of the unvaccinated instead of focusing on a science-driven approach that includes vaccination and natural immunity. Meanwhile, this isn't partisan, it's medicine. Biden is asking Congress to pass more than $22 billion in fresh COVID money. But without funding, we're not going to be able to sustain the testing capacity beyond the month of June. But some Republicans are demanding the new COVID investment be fully offset by savings elsewhere. They're also asking for a full accounting of the COVID dollars already spent so that unspent funds can be repurposed. And despite ongoing talks, a final deal between the two parties is still not a near sight. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Iris Tao, NTD News. The military's COVID-19 vaccine mandate has been blocked for all members of the Navy seeking religious exemptions. A preliminary injunction that previously covered 35 Navy SEALs now covers about 4,000 others who are seeking religious exemptions. U.S. District Judge Reed O'Connor, a George W. Bush appointee, issued the order. O'Connor expanded the ruling in part because each of the original 35 who applied for exemptions never received the accommodation. In his order, O'Connor wrote that the threat to each person is the same, get the jab or lose your job. The Supreme Court recently sided with the Pentagon ruling that Navy commanders can consider vaccination status before deploying a SEAL for missions. But O'Connor's order will prevent the Navy from firing unvaccinated members whose religious exemptions were denied. Republican Senator Susan Collins of Maine says she will confirm Judge Ketanji Brown-Jackson to the Supreme Court. Collins is the first Republican senator to throw her support behind Biden's Supreme Court nominee. I talked to other legal experts and reviewed numerous documents. In the end, I decided that she had the qualifications, the experience and the credentials that we require of a Supreme Court justice and warranted my support. Collins says she doesn't agree with all of Jackson's decisions, but approves of how she approaches her cases. The senator has a record of supporting all Supreme Court nominees, except for Justice Amy Coney Barrett, who was nominated by former President Trump in 2020. All 50 Democratic senators are expected to confirm Jackson's nomination. It's unclear if any other Republican senator will vote yes. Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign and the Democratic National Committee are in hot water after federal officials found they violated rules on reporting expenditures. The Federal Election Commission has fined the Clinton campaign and the Democratic National Committee, or DNC, for not accurately describing payments made to the Perkins Coie law firm. Under federal law, political campaigns must report the name and address of each person they pay more than $200 per year and define the purpose of the payment. Federal officials ruled that the DNC paid more than $1 million to Perkins Coie. The law firm then funneled the money to Fusion GPS for opposition research on the Steele dossier, which became the catalyst for the Russia hoax. Clinton's campaign reported that the money was used for legal services. A U.S. senator on Tuesday invited a panel of speakers to shed light on how Beijing endangers both its citizens and those in free societies. Among them, an architect whose mother was arrested and tortured in China for upholding her beliefs. And 10 days ago, she died. Our Iris Tao was at that event that communist China has chosen, they've chosen, to be our enemy and that we have entered into a new Cold War with Beijing. 
At a roundtable on Tuesday, Senator Rick Scott and a wide array of experts shed light on how Beijing threatens U.S. national security, economy, and human rights. This zero-sum game is evident in Xi's willingness to imprison political dissidents, destroy democracy in Hong Kong, and engage in systematic genocide of the Uyghur people in decades-long persecution against Christians, Tibetans, and members of Falun Gong. And the regime's influence is not only felt within its borders. But if you keep talking about these issues, then you're not going to get another contract. And that is my agent said that to me. And it's Cantor Freedom, a former NBA player and an outspoken critic of China's human rights record, says Beijing's exporting a censorship through its economic influence here. If your mother or if your sister or your wife was in those concentration camps and getting tortured and raped every day, would you still act the same way? Would you still remain silent? And there was a special guest present. He's not an expert or an activist, but he's living through what the regime did to his family. My mom, Jiyun Zhi, a uh, Falun Gong practitioner died nine days ago due to the persecution. Simon Zhang's mom was a practitioner of the spiritual practice Falun Gong. She was arrested in China right before the Beijing Winter Olympics in February and later tortured in detention. My mother is just one of the confirmed deaths of 4,697 Falun Gong practitioners during the ongoing persecution. She was one of the millions of practitioners sent to forced labor camps or who've been tortured and abused. How did you feel when you first heard about the news about your mom in China? I think it's devastating, but much more than that, I don't have a good word for that. This round, she was put into detention center, tortured, and eventually died in the hospital. I never got a chance to speak with her. And Senator Rick Scott on if the U.S. should recognize such persecution as genocide. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's a genocide what they're doing. What they're doing, what they're doing to the Uyghurs, what they're doing to the Tibetans, what they're doing to um, Christians, what they're doing to the Falun Gong uh, practitioners. It's, 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 it's clearly genocide. Reporting Washington, D.C., Iris Tao, NTD News. The Pentagon says that Russia has begun repositioning some of its forces away from the capital of Ukraine. Meanwhile, the U.S. military is discussing the possibility of an increased presence in Eastern Europe. NTD's Jason Perry has the story. The purpose of regrouping our Russian armed forces is to focus on key fronts and, first of all, the complete operations for the total liberation of Donbass. The Russians continued attacks on the capital of Ukraine the day after the defense ministry said they were going to scale back operations to support progress and peace talks with Ukraine. Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby said the Defense Department has seen Russian forces increase airstrikes on the Donbass region, which is home to the port city of Mariupol. The devastating effects that it's having there on, on what can only be described as the civilian infrastructure, uh, residential buildings, hospitals, um, recreation, uh, parks, everything. I mean, the place is just being decimated uh, from a structural perspective uh, by the, the onslaught of, of, of Russian airstrikes. He added that however the war ends, he thinks that U.S. military posture in Europe is not going to be the same. NATO's Supreme Allied Commander Europe, General Todd Walters, elaborated on the possibility of adding permanent bases in Europe at a Senate hearing earlier in the day. What is your best military advice as to whether or not permanent U.S. forces in Poland, Romania, and the Balts will help reassure NATO and deter Russia? Congressman, it's got to change. And, and certainly this is an opportunity as a result of, of this senseless act on behalf of Russia to re-examine the, the permanent military architecture that exists not only in Eastern Europe, uh, but, but in, our, in our air policing activity in aviation and in our standing naval maritime groups. General Walters added that they are working with committed NATO countries and the North Atlantic Council to establish more permanent U.S. military personnel in Eastern Europe. Jason Perry, NTD News. The number of Ukrainians who have fled Russia's attack on their homeland has now surpassed the United Nations' worst-case predictions. The speed and scale of the exodus hasn't been seen in Europe since World War II. NTD's Grace Coulter speaks with an anti-human trafficking organization about what it's like on the ground at Poland's busiest border crossing. Over four million Ukrainians have fled the country since Russia's invasion five weeks ago. Two million of them are children. 
the United Nations said Wednesday that of those 4 million refugees, over 2.3 have gone west into Poland. Austin Shamlin with Lantern Rescue, a US-based anti-human trafficking organization, says the situation on the ground is chaotic. He and his team are currently at Poland's Medica border crossing, where tens of thousands of refugees enter the country daily. It's chaotic. Uh, there's a lot of people coming across and, uh, you know, the security services, the NGOs, the, the local government is overwhelmed. The, um, there, there doesn't seem to be much of a central Polish government response. It's, it's been mainly up to local governments, municipal governments. Um, and, uh, you know, they're struggling. Shamlin and his team are assisting major border crossings and working with local governments to seal procedural gaps that could be exploited. This is, you know, this is different than what we normally do. We're normally helping rescue kids that are, um, you know, have been trafficked. Um, this is more of a preventative. We're trying to prevent the, the trafficking from ever happening. He says the two main issues are lack of coordination and insufficient vetting of volunteers and drivers transporting refugees. He says in some areas, police are doing background checks, but in others, there's no police oversight at all. You know, we also have heard stories of people coming to register as, as a refugee and having children with them, not knowing the names of the children, um, having last, different last names from some of these children. So we really want to help the local government come up with procedures to be able to put somebody from physically crossing the border to on a coach bus or a van that they're going to their final destination um, and, and being able to track them through registration and the drivers and the volunteers having a good process in place to help them register. He says the process is better than it was three weeks ago, but they need more help from the international community. Shamlin is heading to Lviv in Ukraine within the next few days. Once there, they're going to assess different routes into Poland because, he says, it's a security risk for refugees to use the same routes over and over. According to Shamlin, around 500,000 displaced Ukrainians are waiting in Lviv. And if and when the war moves west, they too will leave for Poland. Grace Coulter, NTD News. Coming up, New York City's mayor says the key to stopping violent crime in the subway is to stop fare evasion. That's after multiple attacks during the past week. And leaked videos show Disney officials and producers promoting an LGBT agenda in their programs. The company has openly opposed Florida's recent parental rights law. That and more on NTD News. Navigating a world of economic madness, you need to have the right guide. What do today's decisions mean for your tomorrow? We ask why, what's the alternative? Uncover the deeper reasons and the hidden influences and highlight the real opportunities for profit. At Entity Business, we connect the dots for you. Good evening. Some cities and states across the nation have been taking a softer stance on crime over the past few years. New York City's mayor says that's partially what made the city's subway system an unlawful place. NTD's Arian Pazdar has more from Manhattan. Riding the subway can cost you a lot of money, especially in an expensive city like New York. And poor people are affected the most, so some decide to not pay and jump the turnstile instead. And the city stopped prosecuting fare evasion in order to create a more equitable environment. But the mayor says there are better ways to do that. There's a way to get on the subway system if you don't have enough money to pay your fare. We've created an environment in our subway system where rules don't matter. Just in the past week, a teenage girl was repeatedly punched in the face in an unprovoked attack. A woman was sexually assaulted and a man was robbed and beaten, all in the subway system. Back in the 80s, subway crime in New York City was a big problem as well. The mayor says it was fixed once and it can be fixed again by going after fare evaders. People who commit crimes, they don't pay their fare. 
<laughs> they hopped to turnstile to commit a crime. And so uh, we knew that you had to zero in on those that came into the system to commit a crime. He added that prosecuting a small crime like fare evasion is one of the first steps to stopping bigger and more violent crimes. The mayor isn't the only one getting tough on crime. State Democrats in New York, New Jersey and New Mexico are currently advocating for tough on crime bills. Ariane Pastar, NTD News, New York. The Buffalo Bills are getting a new $1.4 billion stadium. $850 million of that will be paid with taxpayer money. That's the highest amount of taxpayer dollars ever spent on a stadium in the U.S. Some are questioning the hefty public contribution, especially since the governor's husband might profit from the new site. Governor Kathy Hochul's husband is the senior vice president and general counsel for a firm called Delaware North. The firm delivers food and drinks for the Buffalo Bills Stadium and has been doing so for 30 years. According to the New York Post, a government watchdog group questioned how Hochul avoided a conflict in approving the Bills Stadium deal, quote, when her husband's firm, Delaware North, is one of the big winners. A spokeswoman for the governor told the New York Post that Governor Hochul is committed to the strictest ethical standards and restoring trust in government. The firm's contract will expire at the end of 2022 season. After that, the team will put out the contract for a competitive bid. We reached out to the governor's office but did not hear back before broadcast. Recently leaked videos on social media show Disney officials promoting an LGBT agenda to employees. One video shows a producer saying she regularly adds queerness to her shows wherever she can. This comes amid Disney's opposition to Florida's new parental rights law. Investigative journalist Christopher Rufo published these videos on Twitter on Tuesday. He says he obtained them from a Walt Disney Company all-hands meeting on Florida's parental rights bill. One of the videos shows Disney Entertainment President Carrie Burke's support for more LGBT lead characters in Disney stories. And one of our execs stood up and said, you know, we only have a handful of queer leads in our content. And I went, what? I, that can't be true. And I, and I, and I realized, oh, it, it actually is true. We have many, many, many LGBTQIA characters in our stories, and, and, and yet we don't have enough leads. In another video, executive producer Latoya Raveno refers to Disney's support for what she calls her not-at-all-secret gay agenda. The showrunners were super welcoming, Meredith Roberts, and like the, the, our leadership over there has been so welcoming to like my like not at all secret gay agenda. I was just wherever I could just basically adding queerness to like, the, if you see anything queer in the show, I'm proud of them. But like, I, I just was like, no one would stop me and no one was trying to stop me. And another video shows Disney's diversity and inclusion manager, Vivian Ware, saying the company is getting rid of gendered language in its theme parks. We are in the process of changing over those those recorded messages, and so many of you are probably familiar when we brought the fireworks back to the Magic Kingdom. We no longer say ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we say dreamers of all ages. And so I love the fact that it's opened up the creativity, the opportunity for our cast members to look at that. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed the parental rights bill into law on Monday, banning classroom discussions on sexual orientation in kindergarten through third grade. Disney CEO Bob Chapek says the company has been opposed to the bill from the outset. NTD reached out to Disney but didn't get a response before airtime. Imagine that one day your packages are delivered by drones. Well, that day might not be far off. FedEx Express, the world's largest express transportation company, is teaming up with California-based Elroy Air, a company building drones that can pick up, transport and deliver cargo unmanned. FedEx says it will begin testing Elroy Air's Chaparral Autonomous Air Cargo System next year. The Chaparral can lift 300 to 500 pounds of cargo and deliver it by air, up to 300 miles, and it doesn't need an airport for takeoff or landing. Elroy Air says the drone system is designed to be cost and energy efficient. However, while there are many advantages offered by this new technology, privacy, security and safety concerns have arisen with increased reliance on drones. 
NASA astronaut Mark Vandehei and the two Russian cosmonauts who were on the Soyuz MS-19 spacecraft are back on Earth and in good shape. The craft landed in Kazakhstan Wednesday morning, local time. Recovery crews were on hand to help the crew get out of the capsule. The three astronauts will soon be heading to their native countries. Vandehei's 355-day mission was historic, breaking the record for the longest single space flight by a U.S. astronaut. NASA officials say this mission helped pave the way for, quote, future human explorers on the moon, Mars, and beyond. A strong dollar may help with inflation, but you'll know from your trips to the store it's not helping enough. Landlords and property management companies are paying more for things now, too. Is that why rent's gone up so much? NTD's Phil Zoe has more. Sometimes you just can't find uh, what you need out there. Property manager Steve Shaw oversees 70 properties in the Chicago area. He says it's very difficult to find people to do any work. The cost of labor has increased so much, it seems like people just aren't motivated to, to work as hard. Shah says one worker who's been with him for 30 years is charging double for labor, but doing only a fraction of the work that he used to. I do some smaller scale construction projects for myself and uh, the costs have more than doubled. So when you look at it at the end, you question whether you're going to make any profit at all. Rents are up 17 percent in the last year, while home prices are up nearly 20 percent. We might have a showing within 30 minutes of putting it on the MLS system, and we may have multiple applications within two hours. I spoke with property managers Randy and Melissa Stanley out in Houston, Texas. Appliances are the most difficult things to get right now. We're talking about washers, dryers, refrigerators to supply our rental units. Out of the housing frenzy, Stanley has noticed at least one benefit for landlords and property managers. Because there is so much uh, competition, we're able to get a good tenant with a good qualifications in a very short period of time. Phil Zoe, NTD News. An Airbus says its A380 aircraft has completed two trial flights in France powered on cooking oil. The jet was powered by sustainable aviation fuel, or SAF, mostly made of used cooking oil and waste fats. Airbus has already tested SAF fuel on two other airliners. It hopes to get its aircraft certified to fly on SAF by the end of the decade. Airbus planes can currently be powered by up to 50 percent SAF, blended with traditional kerosene. Some airlines already use the fuel in limited amounts, but it's expensive, so it probably won't be used widely anytime soon. Coming up, the nation's first task force on reparations for slavery had a historic vote last night. But is everyone happy with the decision? Several California cities are setting up speed tracking cameras on their streets. Advocates are promoting safety, while opponents raise concerns about personal privacy. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. Oh, hey, doesn't it feel like there's communists everywhere? In fact, the Chinese Communist Party has been subverting America from every angle. So whether it's compromising our politicians, controlling Hollywood, manipulating Wall Street, or infiltrating our schools, they have stopped at nothing to take down America. And I believe that in order for us to not become like China, we need citizens who know the truth. 
So go on over to getepic.com, stay informed with a subscription to the Epic Times, and you will get instant access to this infographic. The 2022 NTD 8th International Chinese Vocal Competition will be held from September 29th to October 2nd at the Merkin Hall of Kaufman Music Center in New York City. The competition is honored to have specially invited vocalists with the world-renowned Shen Yun Performing Arts to serve on its panel of judges. The gold award is $10,000. For more information, please visit vocal.ntdtv.com. Over to the West Coast. The first in the nation, California Reparations Task Force, had a historic vote last night. They decided to place limits on which members of the black community can receive compensation for America's history of slavery. NTD's Arlene Richards reports. The California Task Force on Reparations voted 5-4 to four Tuesday to limit state compensation to the descendants of free and enslaved black people who were in the U.S. in the 19th century. The vote rejects a proposal to include all black people, regardless of lineage. Those who voted against the limitation argued that all black people in the U.S. who suffer from systemic racism in housing, education, and employment should be compensated. Critics have said that California should not pay reparations because it did not practice slavery. James Breslow, an attorney and host of the Hidden Truth Show podcast, said it's odd that California is taking the lead on reparations when Congress hasn't moved on it in 30 years. But you have a state legislature that it has a supermajority of progressives on it, and this has kind of a, been a progressive dream policy for a long time. So California is the one that's actually able to implement it. The task force received evidence that black residents were forced to live in predominantly minority neighborhoods and were denied bank loans to purchase property. So what is your opinion about what is contributing to the black community's problems if it's not slavery? What we do know is that the lack of black fathers in the home, in the, the black community, has been a significant cause of issues in the black community. Barack Obama was someone who famously pointed out all of the difficulties that arise when you're raised in a single parent home. The task force has until July 2023 to submit a proposal to the legislature for consideration. Arlene Richards, NTD News, New York. Cameras that record license plates and vehicles may soon come to several cities in California. It's to prevent speeding. And one mayor is pushing to address the number of traffic fatalities in Silicon Valley. Here's more from NTD's David Lamb. Sam Licardo, mayor of San Jose, is pushing for speeding cameras in the city. He testified before the state assembly on Monday via call. In my city of San Jose, as in cities throughout California, we've seen a horrific increase in auto-related deaths. And we know from our data, 30% of those auto fatalities, speeding constitute a key cause of that collision. Automated speed enforcement clearly works. Currently, California law prohibits cities from using speed cameras. As part of the new Assembly Bill 2336, the Speed Safety Pilot Program would allow several cities to do a test run for 30 days, issuing warnings. The speed safety system will capture images of the rear license plate of vehicles. Now, there are multiple safeguards embedded in this bill. For instance, you have to be going at least 11 miles an hour over the speed limit because we're looking for the more egregious drivers. The money that's generated in fines has to go right back into that very same community for physical infrastructure to make those roads safer. After the 30 days, violation penalties start at $50 and the fees double based on how fast the car is driving over the posted limit. But if the driver is moving at or above 100 miles per hour, it's $500. Opponents of the bill are concerned with privacy issues and transparency. While we appreciate efforts to address some of the privacy concerns with the surveillance technology in AB 2336, the bill does not adequately protect privacy, nor does it strike the appropriate balance between personal privacy and government transparency. Participating cities include Los Angeles, Glendale, San Francisco, Oakland, and San Jose. Another Southern California city may be included later. The speed enforcement cameras will not apply to highways or expressways. AB 2336 was introduced in February 
and if approved, it could remain effective until 2028. David Lamb, NTD News, California. California has been seeing more and more people moving out of the state, and the latest census confirmed just that. An urban policy analyst says the high cost of living and land ownership are reasons for saying goodbye to the Golden State. People are leaving California in droves. So many people have been leaving California that for the first time ever, the state has lost a congressional seat. According to recent census data, Los Angeles County lost the most people in the country due to relocation. In 2021, we have only state figures at the moment provided by the U.S. Census Bureau. The outmigration from California to the other 49 states plus the District of Columbia was 367,000. That is a huge number. It is the largest number in terms of outmigration from California since 2000. Wendell Cox, an urban policy analyst, explains to California's insider, Siamak Karami, the reason for the exodus, and it's not the poor who are leaving. The largest group of people leaving in the income categories that IRS uses make from 100,000 to 200,000 family income or household income per year. That's above the median household income of $83,000 in California. Most people would think the California climate is wonderful, such as access to beaches and coastal weather. But cost of living is an issue. Cox compares the median house prices to the median household income. Then you can judge housing affordability. California was only 20% above the nation. Now it's more than twice as much, about 2.25 times as much. Terribly unaffordable. He says people want to own their own homes, but it's difficult. You haven't seen any new auto companies move into California. Nobody's coming in from outside. Why? They, don't, they, they want to have people that can live well on their salaries because salaries aren't that much higher in California. But housing costs certainly are. Senate Bill 9, or the California Home Act, went into effect this year. It allows homeowners to build up to four housing units on their land. The value of land is based upon what you can build on it. And so if I can only build a, a single family detached house, but now you say I can build a house in the backyard, the value of the land goes up. It is the land values that are killing it. Cox says there's high demand for detached housing. He believes the solution is to incentivize the younger generation and companies to want to stay in California. You can watch the full program on California Insider on YouTube or Epic TV on the Epic Times website. And one of California's world-renowned attractions is preparing to reopen to the public after a two-year closure. The luxurious and extravagant site is none other than Hearst Castle. World-famous, lavish, enchanting Hearst Castle will reopen to the public on May 11th. Officially known as Hearst San Simeon State Historical Monument, the house has been closed for two years due to pandemic lockdowns and repairs. California's Department of Parks and Recreation announced last week that the Enchanted Hill will be welcoming guests in less than two months' time. The castle closed to the public just over two years ago on March 16, 2020. California State Parks Director Armando Quintero said he is thrilled to reopen the state treasure. He said, we are confident that these once-in-a-lifetime repairs and improvements to the road facility will serve countless generations to come. The mansion is filled with ornate decorations, along with both ancient and classic artwork. Hearst Castle is located in San Luis Obispo County. Its construction was done through a partnership between William Randolph Hearst and architect Julia Morgan. Hearst made his fortune through inheritance and yellow journalism reporting that promoted sensationalism over facts. Morgan was the first female architect licensed in California. State parks will offer a Julia Morgan tour in honor of the 100th anniversary of the castle's construction, albeit delayed by two years. And in Texas, talks of energy independence are gaining more ground as gas prices rise and the Biden administration points to sanctions on Russian oil over the Ukraine war. Texas Governor Greg Abbott met with leaders in the oil industry Tuesday to discuss how the Lone Star State can help. And it's time to choose Midland over Moscow. Texas Governor Greg Abbott delivered remarks Tuesday to top executives in the Texas energy industry. 
He was invited to speak by the Texas Independent Producers and Royalty Owners Association, or TIPRO. So with the turmoil in Europe, the Texas energy industry has proven to be never more important than it is today. He said Texas's oil production is a key player in improving the state's economy and helping the U.S. become energy independent. There are more than a million Texans who are employed in the energy sector, the energy sector that made America energy independent. I think Texas, probably oil and gas pays about 30 percent of everything in Texas. Right? I mean, we, we provide a lot of money back to the, to the state. The governor said the biggest challenges to U.S. energy independence and the growth of Texas's oil industry come from strict regulations. We will lead the fight against any official and any rule and any reg regulation that hinders the production of oil and gas in Texas. President Biden agreed last week to send more liquefied natural gas, or LNG, to Europe to reduce their dependence on Russian gas. TIPRO's newest report states that Texas makes up a quarter of U.S. natural gas production and will supply about 85 percent of the LNG export. All Washington needs to do is to unleash the oil and gas sector in Texas and in the United States of America. Texas has got to lead the way. I mean, we are the, one of the biggest producers on the planet. The governor's speech follows the Biden administration's Monday budget proposal. In it, there are plans to fund more renewable energy and to eliminate tax breaks for the oil industry, which will likely increase costs for oil and gas production. Coming up, Germany prepares for an emergency, energy emergency, in case Russia stops oil and gas deliveries. One German official is telling people to wear warmer sweaters. And in the UK's biggest maternity scandal, a new report finds that a government trust in England presided over catastrophic failings for 20 years. It led to hundreds of babies being stillborn, dying shortly after birth, or being left severely brain damaged. Find out more in just a moment here on NTD News. At The Nation Speaks, we don't just scratch the surface. We want to go wide and deep. Our viewers come away with a much richer understanding of the issues of the day. We really make a big effort to bring on different voices onto the show. We don't just talk to experts and newsmakers, which of course are extremely important, but we also want to hear from the American people. So the people who are impacted by the policies and issues that we're talking about, because what they have to say is just as important to the national conversation. Over to Europe. Amid soaring energy costs, a German official is telling his people to wear warmer sweaters. And those costs could apparently quadruple if Russia stops sending energy, which it's threatening to do. And TD's Faye Quarter has more. Germany is preparing for Russia to cut off its energy. This is because Russia wants Germany to pay for its energy in rubles. And Germany is refusing to pay for Russian energy in rubles. Russia is desperate. Their currency, the ruble, has been in free fall really since the start of the Ukraine war and Europe's massive sanctions hit them to the point where it's lost well over half of its value. Nicholas Creel is a business professor at Georgia College and State University. Creel says Russia wants to get the ruble's value back up. Germany would have to go find a way to purchase rubles and then give that to the companies that they're selling, getting gas from. Functionally, what this means is the demand for rubles would go up with the supply staying the same. That means the value of it would have to increase. And Germany won't do it because that would undermine contracts. So now it's implementing its emergency plan. We are in a situation where I have to say that every kilowatt hour saved helps. That's why I would like to declare an early warning stage with an appeal to companies and private consumers to help us. Ukraine, Germany, by saving gas and energy altogether. Recent data shows that 62 percent of Germany's energy comes from gas and oil. Germany gets half its gas and a third of its oil from Russia. 
On Germany's government website, its emergency plan seems to mainly involve asking shippers to increase shipments and consumers to consume less. I don't think there is an emergency plan. They're trying to figure it out as they go. They've been living in dreamland. They don't have they don't have an alternative. Brent Bennett is the policy director for Life Powered at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Bennett says it would be devastating if Germany stopped receiving Russian energy and that energy prices could quadruple. But Bennett believes Russia's bluffing. You know, Russia doesn't have uh, there are there the demand for Russian oil and gas has already declined dramatically, and their gas is being sold at a huge discount. So, um, as long as Russia doesn't have other buyers, then Russia doesn't have anywhere else to go. Meanwhile, Germany had the second highest electricity prices in the world just last June. Faye Porter, NTD News. The UK is facing a big maternity scandal. Some 200 babies and nine mothers could have survived if a National Health Service trust had provided better care, according to an independent inquiry. The second and final report published today says the trust did not learn from its own inadequate investigations over 20 years and tried to blame the mothers for their baby's death. The story comes from NTD's Joanne Robson. The inquiry into the maternity care of Shrewsbury and Telford Hospital NHS Trust published its final report on Wednesday. The damning report led by maternity expert Donna Ockenden reviewed over 1,500 clinical incidents, mostly from 2000 to 2019. The report found there were repeated errors in care which led to injury to either mothers or their babies. From our review of all cases that make up this final report, we identify four key pillars to drive forward improvements in maternity services at the Shrewsbury and Telford Hospital NHS Trust and all other trusts across England. These are safe staffing levels properly funded, a well-trained workforce, learning from incidents and listening to families. A review of nearly 500 stillbirths found that one in four had significant or major concerns over the maternity care given, which, if managed appropriately, might or would have resulted in a different outcome. Some 40% of the stillbirths were never investigated by the Trust. Some babies suffered skull fractures, broken bones or developed cerebral palsy after traumatic forceps deliveries, while others were starved of oxygen and experienced life-changing brain injuries. Rhiannon Davies, who has campaigned for years over the poor care, lost her daughter Kate hours after her birth in March 2009. In my own case, I wanted to lie down and die, to be quite frank with you, and they blamed me and um, clearly this has happened to other families and other mothers and it's it was obviously a, a, a method that, that they used because it would close you down it would make you question yourself not them Ockenden said there were still families continuing to contact their review team between 2020 and 2021 over the safety of maternity care they received at the Shrewsbury and Telford Hospital NHS Trust she said a current staff member at the trust told the review team they were frightened to speak out for fear of reprisals. Speaking in Parliament, Health Secretary Sajid Javid said the repeated failures painted a tragic and harrowing picture of care spanning two decades. And the failures of care and compassion that are set out in this report have absolutely no place in the NHS. To all the families that have suffered so greatly, I am sorry. The report clearly shows that you were failed by a service that was there to help you and your loved ones to bring life into this world. We will make the changes that the report says are needed at both a local and national level. Joanne Robson, NTD News. Coming up, one of the last courtroom sketch artists in Chicago shares insights from the courthouse. For centuries, the public has seen courtroom dramas through the sketches of artists. But the number of courtroom artists is dwindling, and there is hardly anyone new joining the industry. And in Australia, miniature sheep are gaining popularity. Demand is growing for a breed known as the baby doll Southdown, that's just two feet tall. More when we return on NTD News.
Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, CEO of MyPillow. Retailers, shopping channels, and now even banks have tried to cancel myself and MyPillow. During these times, your support has meant everything to us. So my employees and I want to personally thank each and every one of you by passing the savings directly on to you. We're selling the best products ever for the best prices ever. For example, we have my towels with proprietary technology, which makes them soft and absorbent. Towels that work, what a concept. They're made with USA cotton and come in a variety of awesome colors. My six-piece towel set is regularly $109.99, now just $39.99 with your promo code. So go to MyPillow.com now and use the promo code on your screen or call the 1-800 number below to receive this exclusive offer. If you do it right now, I'm going to include a free gift with your purchase. Thank you and God bless. You may have seen courtroom illustrations on TV and in newspapers for high-profile trials such as those of Juzzy Smollett and Ghislaine Maxwell. Cameras are still banned from federal courts here in the U.S., but many state courts do allow cameras in some capacity. The courtroom sketch artist was once a permanent position in almost every news outlet, but now they're becoming harder and harder to find. NTD speaks to one of the last remaining courtroom illustrators in Chicago. Cheryl Cook has been sketching courtroom dramas for four decades. Courtroom illustration is not an easy job, so there were few artists to begin with. Now, Cook is one of only two remaining courtroom artists in Chicago. She recounted how she fell into the job. The Chicago Tribune looking for somebody they could draw from life. Evidently, that's a skill set. I had no idea. <laughs> they, uh, they said it's difficult to find people who can just draw somebody that's moving around in the room. They're not sitting for you. They're not posing. With a degree in design and illustration, Cook got an interview to draw someone wandering around. She did it, and they liked it, and the rest is history. In the beginning, Cook had no clue what the newspaper wanted, but she learned and eventually mastered the craft. If somebody's doing an opening statement, they want it covered. If somebody that is a very high-profile person that's well-known, they want that. Or if the story is about what the judge's verdict is going to be, they want the judge. It comes down to really just pretty simple you know, just understanding the court process and knowing what is happening and what's critical. Courtroom illustration requires speed and accuracy, but Cook loves the challenge. You've got to be fast and kind of have a good memory for what you saw. You almost do an imprint on your memory of what you're looking at so that you can fill in some of those little holes um, in the few minutes you get after this is all over and everybody's filing out of the room. You've got to be able to put it down and still get it before a camera. There are days when you just, you're on and everything you put down is so accurate and so well done that you have to go out of there feeling good about yourself. Not only does Cook feel gratified by her work, but she also enjoys seeing the legal system at work. It's fascinating to watch the legal process, to see that it does work. In the digital age, people may question what an artist can do that a camera cannot. I can actually discern what's happening. I can take a temperature that a camera can't. I can see that there's like somebody weeping in the second aisle. Maybe there's the camera's not going to indiscriminately just turn around and go to whatever's happening in the room. And critics have long argued that cameras can also create distractions in the courtroom and interfere with the judicial process. Despite an artist's advantages, Cook thinks the profession is dying. She says it's just a matter of time before the court revamps its camera system. Cook is the last female courtroom artist in Chicago, where there's only one other male artist. Small in size, but big in personality. Miniature sheep are popping up on hobby farms across Queensland, Australia. The baby dole South Down breed is rare in the country, but demand is growing as word spreads. Let's take a look. Baby doll South Down sheep are growing in popularity in Australia, and it's not hard to see why. These sheep are just two feet tall, and they have a teddy bear smile. They just have a, a beautiful personality, and that shines through. Joanna Willens owns a property in Queensland, Australia. 
There she operates just one of four studs in the world that breed the colored baby doll. She aims for brown and black wool to set her flock apart. We picked up this ram and we put him in with the girls and he had some gorgeous colored babies. So we thought, wow, this is, this is something special, something different. Willens is fielding interest from buyers as far away as South Australia. This rare breed of sheep won't be grazing in large-scale pastures, but more and more hobby farmers are keen to get their hands on the tiny animals. One of them is Sally Parkinson, who owns a farm on the outskirts of Brisbane. The friendly and relaxed nature of these sheep make them perfect companions for her and the rest of her animals. I think it's that, you know, the cute factor, the fact that they're miniature, and I could just see that on a small hobby farm style place that they would be um, a cute type of pet to have. Parkinson has even been able to teach her little friends a few tricks. They just expect a food reward and a brush down afterwards. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.